Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm here with Troy Harkin, uh, instructional technology coach at the Shanghai American School in China. Um, and as you can imagine, they're a little ahead of the U.S. and other places in terms of dealing with the pandemic. I think they're about eight weeks in now. And so, Troy, welcome. Why don't you start by just kind of telling us how SAS has responded so far in the first couple months? What are you, what are you uh, doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Scott. So when this all started, um, schools in China were on Lunar New Year, or Chinese New Year break. So by that point, we already had kind of a few days of not being around students to try to organize things. And I think in that way, it's similar to schools in the States right now that might have been going through spring break before they were able to start putting their plan in place. Um, when we first started, we didn't really have a clear timeline about how long it was going to go for. Um, I think initially we thought it could be a couple of weeks, you know, maybe a month. Um, and then, you know, as it continued to uh, get bigger and bigger, we realized that this was going to be longer term. Sure. Um, yeah. So our, what we had in place originally has been continued to, has continued to evolve uh, based on the amount of time and the amount of resources and the amount of, uh, different ideas that have been generated through this new learning environment for our students and our and our uh, teachers, the whole community, actually. So, so what does it look like right now? So, what does learning and teaching look like? What does sure. with families look like? Yeah. So uh, right now, uh, we have students and teachers in approximately twenty different time zones around the world. <laughs> so when you try to look at this uh, idea of having synchronous learning versus asynchronous learning, uh, we have both. So we're synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. Uh, so what that looks like is uh, teachers are holding uh, online classes. Um, you can call them office hours or drop-in sessions or what have you. Uh, but a lot of teachers are holding classes using Microsoft Teams uh, for the middle school and high school. Uh, and then also using Zoom in the elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, and so students get to interact with their teachers uh, for about two hours a week. Uh, and the teachers, based on where we are in the world, is normally like one in the morning and one in the evening someplace. So that way all students are able to access uh, resources and face-to-face -face time with teachers. Right. Um, in addition to that, we also have upskilled a lot of our staff on our learning management system platforms, uh, which is a mix of Schoology, Seesaw, uh, Office 365 uh, in order to get them uh, up to a point where they're able to deliver uh, effective uh, online teaching for so, students, they're synchronously or asynchronously. Got it. And have you know, one of the things that's been interesting to me, to me as I talk with folks is that they're really wor worried about losing families or kids who just kind of like drop out, they like disappear. Yeah. They go black. Has that happened at SAS or you? It, feel like you've got most of your family still with you. We have a lot of our families still with us. Uh, the community has been pretty solid overall. Um, some of the things that have worked for us is we've developed tracking systems to see when students are able to get online, uh, also finding out where they are in the world, uh, what subjects are they you know, struggling with, what, struggling, what subjects are they doing fine with, and we do that in coordination with our uh, student support services team. Okay. Uh, so we have counselors all the way through elementary through high school, and there's a team of them. And through them and uh, the heads of school for each division, they've been reaching out to families that have been, you know, either we felt like we haven't been able to reach them as teachers or feel disconnected in some way, just to figure out what's going on. Um, and so by this point, everybody's been in contact uh, at least a few times uh, for, for one thing or another. And we've, um, yeah, continued to try to support the community on all sides uh, mm -hmm. through, uh, I guess, letters from the, the heads of school, uh, going out to families individually, uh, updates on a weekly basis from a few different people. And we're really trying to foster this <clears throat> recognition that, yeah, our learning style, uh, what we see day to day has very much changed for a lot of families. Um, yeah. Figure yeah. out how to teach them, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Troy, what do you think are some things that SES has done that have worked really well? So I think one of the biggest things that we did that worked really well was we had 
some kind of skeleton in place at the beginning uh, done by some of the other instructional tech coaches that I work with uh, for distance learning. Uh, they put something in place for, you know, what do we do if we have a snow day or, you know, a bad weather day and kids can't come to campus, we still need right. to have access materials at school. Um, so that was put in place like a year or two ago. And so we had that at least in the beginning to say, okay, this is what we can work with. And then myself along with um, the rest of the tech coaches, uh, tech director, um, has a school, put together this plan that continued to evolve and adapt as we realized how much longer this is going to go. So I think that last got updated at the beginning of March. And so by then we were already doing this for six weeks. Mm -hmm. So that's probably our biggest thing is that we have a plan and we are willing and able to adapt that plan uh, as we go based on feedback from students, based on feedback from teachers and families, uh, just to see how we can best meet the needs of our, of our kids. Um, the plan is shareable. Uh, it's been shared with the IBO. And so they, they've passed it out to schools that are uh, going through this, which is a lot of people around the world right now. Right, right. Uh, and I think that, yeah, having that plan uh, has been really effective. In terms of day to day, uh, we've provided training sessions for all staff at all levels of the school uh, for how to use the platforms more successfully. So we've done live webinars uh, for Microsoft Teams a couple times a week, again, based on where they are in the world. So we host them at different times of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done uh, regular updates for how to use Schoology and Zoom and Seesaw and links to resources. And yep. yeah, we have this database growing from that. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of good things the school's done, I would say. Very cool. So, Troy, you know, like schools here in the U.S., for example, uh, you know, the, right now they're scrambling just to figure out sort of these first week or two things. But what are sort of the challenges or sticking points, you know, a couple months in? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> burnout, for sure. Hmm. I think that um, a lot of our families, uh, that we work with, you know, they were in lockdown. So mm -hmm. the kids weren't able to leave, leave their homes mm -hmm. and some of them still, still can't. And so how do you try to make that environment as accessible as possible for them, given, uh, those types of physical constraints? Um, and at the same time, because it's longer term, you can no longer say, okay, we're going to give you busy work. You know, we're just going to chat, you know, jump in and say, Hey, you have to go back and see how you can look at standards for assessment and what that can look like in these days. Mm -hmm. uh, those are going to be some of the longer term challenges I think schools will be facing here in the States. Uh, but at the same time, there's two and a half months left in the year, maybe for a lot of the schools. So hopefully because they're not starting off their school years, I guess like in Australia where they started 10 weeks ago, right. uh, they can figure out a way to finish what they already have in place and just change the format of it in the online setting. The other biggest issue is going to be equity in terms of uh, accessibility to the internet. And I know that a lot of internet service providers have been now opening up their, their broadband and their bandwidth to allow for more homes to have be connected. Um, but I still feel that because of the context of certain schools and districts, not everybody's going to get that access. And so how are you going to be able to reach those kids? How are you going to be able to reach those families? And that's something that I think a lot of districts are working on individually to see how they can best meet the needs of their community. Um, so I guess with that, every district is going to be different in terms of what their setup is for distance learning. Um, and they have to figure out what resources do they already have that they can just really utilize to their, to their maximum potential. Uh, that's what we had to do. Yeah, no, fair enough. And, you know, I was reading recently about, you know, sort of this idea that because we don't have a national curriculum, right, mm -hmm. that we can't broadcast out to like, you know, the statewide, or nationwide right. sort of lessons or activities because every school or every district is different. And so, you know, even, you know, international baccalaureate could theoretically create some common you know activities or right. instructional work that could be broadcast out to all ib schools but uh the individuality of the different locations and school settings uh really puts the burden on the local people doesn't it if, uh, it, it does <laughs> it, it very much does and even for the ib like they can really if they ever tried to attempt to do that i think could only do it for the diploma level kids so right. 11 and 12 myp it's still you know 
focus on your own thing and PYP, it's your units of inquiry and that can totally look very different from school to school. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Troy, we're coming up on our last minute or so here. What else do you want to share? Um, for all the teachers around the world, uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, a lot more people are getting connected online right now in terms of sharing ideas and resources. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be a little teeny tiny part of that. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I'm very grateful for my colleagues that I've been able to do this with. And so for districts that only have one person, um, yeah, give yourself, give yourself a break. Sometimes you're going to need it. Okay. And that's okay to sometimes say, I'm going to need to, you know, wait on this for a day or two because it's going to be a lot and you're going to get through it in some way, shape or form. You're going to get through it. But, um, yeah, thank you for all the work that you guys are doing really as teachers. It's, it's a big call to action. Troy, that was awesome. I can't end this episode any better than that. Thank you for your time and for sharing what the Shanghai American School is doing. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much, Scott.